The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. This week and last week and the week before, the Parent Leaders Advocacy Group put together political forums with mayoral candidates, borough president candidates, and city council candidates. And there's going to be another one, which we're going to be able to tell you about eventually. We're putting it together. And I say we because I moderated those forums. In addition, the Bronx Consortium, which is a group of uh, principals, school principals, uh, are also putting on a forum. And that, that will be, it looks like, with borough president candidates. So what that got me thinking was it's time that we revisit education in the Bronx, talk to parents, talk to a principal who is not part of that consortium, as a matter of fact, she's an independent principal of a Bronx school, and let's do a check-in and find out what is going on in education in the Bronx. Are they in school? Are they out of school? Are they doing okay? How are the kids? What do the parents say that it's about time we get done in the Bronx? All of the above. So let's uh, introduce everybody who's with us. Uh, the principal of MS45, the Thomas C. Giordano Middle School. She's back with us again, Anna Maria Giordano. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. And the president of the Bronx Parent Leaders Advocacy Group and also uh, president of Community Education Council 8. It is my friend Farah Despains. Nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Gary. And uh, the person who actually was the timekeeper during all those forums that we did. And by the way, they're all going to be shown on BronxNet. We're moving the, the files and uh, BronxNet will uh, be broadcasting all of those forums. You'll find out when that's on. Um, Amy Chai is a verse vice president of the Bronx Parent Leaders Advocacy Group and a District 75 parent. Nice to have you with us, Amy Chai. Thank you so much, Gary. Let's start with you, um, Ms. Giordano. Now, uh, people may or may not recall you were with us in October. And at that time, things were still, and maybe they're still like this. Who knows what's going on in schools? So I guess between then and now, um, how are we doing? I remember you were, were saying, you know what? We're kind of doing okay. I have a really dedicated group of teachers and that's really helped. Um, so why don't you give us an update of here we are in May to 2021, six months later, seven months later, how are we doing? You know what? I think we are doing even better than October. We were dipping our feet, you know, in the waters and just trying to figure out how to keep everybody safe, how to teach our kids in this remote world um, with not a lot of uh, professional development, learning on our own and learning together. Currently, um, due to the last learning preference survey, we brought back 50 more students and we were so thrilled. And I have to tell you, the parents brought their kids in the morning when we were outside um, greeting kids. The parents were so excited. The kids were so excited. And what's great is we know every kid's name. There may be 700 kids in our school, not currently, of course. But because of the interactions we have, my staff, myself, the, the administrative team, you know, when Ethan pulled up with his mom, I knew that was Ethan because I see him on camera and, you know, oh, I that's see him interesting. In so um, are you fully back? All the children are back? Now, let, let me just recall in October, I think you told us only sixth graders were in, right? Or no, or, we had. Um, or do I have it mixed up? Go ahead. You tell that's us. Fine. We were able to bring back six, seven and eighth graders, but only a, a, a small number. Um, based on social distancing and what parents wanted. I think as parents realized how safe school is, my, our school, many schools, when the learning survey opened again, um, 50 parents asked for their children to come back and we had the space for that. So currently we have about 200 children in the building with social distancing, 
six feet, masking and all of that. And the rest of my students are still home, which was the choice of the families. I've got two questions that we're going to go to the parents and get their perspective on similar kinds of things for their own children and other children in the Bronx. The first thing is, what? how were the kids who have just come back? Did you find that they were disconnected? Did they have a hard time learning? Uh, you know, did, did you have to like reorient them? By the way, this is school, you know, that kind of thing. Or, or were they, well, it's just another way of learning and another way of being. I think most of them, because the week before I had the Dean and the AP reach out uh, individually to the parent and the child. Both of them gave them their program, let them know if they were having a new teacher because a remote teacher may be different than an in-person. So I think the week before getting them acclimated, even though they weren't physically here, I think it was okay because we plan our units of study and our pacing calendars, it didn't matter if you were learning sixth grade science remotely or in person. The content, wow. the curriculum, the instruction was seamless. And then logically, the next, this, the, the second question in this group is, um, how are the students doing who are learning remotely? And are you concerned that there will be some kind of learning curve or some issue when you try to get them back to school? I firmly believe in, um, you know, I love my staff. You know, I have a great I know staff. you do. That's why we have you here. We want to spread the good things. Yeah, my staff is amazing, like many schools. But, you know, I don't think that this pandemic has caused more kids to have more difficulties or more challenges when it comes to the actual instruction. What we try to have kids do is be accountable for yourself. You're a sixth grader, you're starting middle school, we're gonna guide you there. And I have to say, I just sent an email to my staff yesterday morning. My teachers during their prep time are having open office hours for the remote students. So if wow. they missed the class, if they woke up late, whatever the, you know, whatever is going on is going on and we have to support that. So for a half hour in the afternoon, they're meeting with kids who may have missed their class. Well, you know, th that's very interesting. And in a way of, of training them, because that is what you get, of course, in college, if you go to the right college, uh, where, where you get some interaction. Plus, it makes the child own up, you know, which you might not even get if they were in school. All right, let's bring the parents in. Um, Ms. Despains, let's uh, talk with you. Why did you go about working morning, noon and night for many, many days to try and put uh, elected officials in front of Bronx parents? Well, thank you for that question, Gary, because I think as parents, we feel the need to truly advocate, you know, for ourselves and for our children. And we have been locked out of the process, right? Uh, at least at the beginning, uh, you know, some efforts have been made, but this is the truth. And this is what I've always believed because I'm a former teacher myself, that there is no way right, we can educate a child if the community and the parents are not directly involved. So you can't make decisions for our children and the way they will be in school, especially in the middle of a pandemic. If we as parents, we are not aware of what's going on in the building and how you are putting the education of our children in such a stressful uh, situation. So for me and for the parents that I represent, we were truly angry uh, with the mayor and with the chancellor, uh, the former chancellor, for not bringing us to the table soon enough. And then when they did, it was such in a superficial way. It was like, this is what we are going to do. Right, right. Well, it they, they were telling you what had yes. already been decided rather than asking your opinions or getting some input. Absolutely. And you can't do that because in the middle of a pandemic, we're talking about lives here, the lives of our children and potentially our lives and the lives of the grandparents who live. Well, listen, in the future of, of the Bronx, New York City, uh, New York State and the United States of America, let's be honest. Um, so um, why did why was it important to bring those candidates? I guess it was to be able to express the issues that are there and help parents understand which candidate was going to be able to do what? I mean, is that the logical conclusion here? Yes, that's part of it. I think the first the first part of, of the whole thing is to make sure to have elected officials and candidates understand that parents need to be at the table from day one, from minute one. And secondly, if you want the job to represent us 
and to represent uh, the needs of our kids, you need to be listening to them. It's not enough for you to be listening to special interest groups or to people who donate to your campaign. You need to listen to the grassroots and the people who are impacted by the decisions that you make. So we too need to be at the table. And, and uh, as you know, at the beginning of each one of those forums, I made it clear that it was not only about education of the students, educating the parents about the candidates, but educating the candidates yeah. about what a lot of these issues are. All right, now I'm going to ask the um, stupidest question of the day, and that will be to um, Ms. Tsai. Um, so how's special ed doing? And do you think special ed is being treated uh, equitably in the city of New York? And I'm going to hide my eyes as you answer this question. Gary, it's not an it's not it's not an embarrassing question. Um, <laughs> it just so, seems so obvious to me. I'm so sorry, but that you know that we really have work to do in special education. That's my own uh, impression of it. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, I have to say, special education historically has been a challenge, a very big challenge, not just with our special needs children in general education classrooms, but as well in our District 75 programs and our District 79 programs. Um, special education during this time of remote has been the most challenge. And for students that have uh, very challenging disabilities that prevent them from able to use technology as we are using now on a Zoom platform. Children with behavioral issues who can't sit still, who have ADHD, students that have tendencies to uh, emotional uh, needs that are not met through Zoom or Google Meets um, are sometimes at the flaw of the deal. Yeah, they've been, they've been left behind. Exactly. And there has been demands prior to this pandemic where services weren't provided, quality support staff have not been provided. And, you know, it's, it's really important how we meet the mandates, federal mandates issued by the IDEO Act, be service to our students here in New York City with special needs. So from uh, I know we, we could probably spend three hours having this dialogue, but from your perspective, what, what do we need to do? What, what would be the first thing? What would you want a mayoral candidate or a borough president or a city council candidate to do to begin to address this? Because we're not going to change it overnight, but we got to get started, right? Oh, definitely. And I have to say, one of the biggest issues that has been brought to the forefront in the former Chancellor Carranza's position when he came in was the lack of transparency and the lack of decision making mm. for parents. Appeals process is during our mayor candidate forum has been discussed. The appeals process has been extremely long. It takes literally more than probably a year, a school year oh. long, or even more than that. Can and you imagine? I, I, this is why I asked the question originally the way I asked it, because it's it's out of control. It's not controlled. I Absolutely. And, you know, the New York State has done their investigation inside to say with uh, th about 180,000 students with IEP services, which is individual educational plans, have only 20 investigators investigating all these appeals. And the DOE has failed to ensure that services are provided and supports are available. So we need to start from there and make sure that the system is revamped and reimagined for this upcoming and, uh, mayor uh, administration. And just going back to those forums, that's where leadership comes in. And, exactly. and, and I'm going to talk to right now somebody who I think is a, a very good school leader. And um, I'm going to ask the question, what I heard from the two parents, it's always a communication problem. It's like if you don't communicate with parents, they feel left out and they may really have some input. And as we just heard from Ms. Tsai, if we don't communicate with parents, we don't know how to address some of these big issues. What do you do in your school? You already talked about one-on-one -on -one with the children. Um, talk to me about just visualizing a good communications plan, not only in the school, but maybe even in a district or a city. I think in our district, and we're, and we're District 10, which is a very, very large district, I think between the um, parent coordinators, which I have and many schools have, not every school has to have, and you have to build a 
a collaborative, committed staff that knows parents are our partners. So when we talk about parent engagement pre-pandemic, you know, it wasn't about just calling mom and saying, you know, Anna Maria wasn't in school today. It was calling mom and Anna Maria and saying, how can I help you? I noticed Anna Maria wasn't in school today. You must make those personal connections. And don't get me wrong, it's not easy. Some teachers have 150 students, some only have 60. But with the support of the administration, because we make phone calls as well, hi, how you doing? Whatever it is, we have deans, we have guidance, we have a large support staff in our building. And I think that helps parents feel more connected. Also with, I think Zoom and the parent, uh, the pandemic has forced me to have more parent forums and to have parents more involved in, in what we're doing in school and what their input is. Uh, and Ms. I think D they appreciate that. Ms. Despains, that probably sounds like music to your ears. I'm, I'm guessing. I mean, this is this is the kind of engagement, and I'm not. I, I realize you look at some of the global situations, but you know, we got to start this way, right? One one on one, and it's harder to do now, right? Yes, and I, I agree, and and I want to make clear that it's not the whole system that's like that because we do have beautiful principals like Ms. Giordano who does that work. And for us at District 8, when we had Dr. Tobaya, who's now the executive superintendent, uh, parents at the table. Was I don't know if people can see, but Ms. Giordano was applauding, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and now with uh, Superintendent Joint, I think it's going to continue the same way. But I think the problem for us as parents, we don't want it to be individual principals or individual teachers or individual superintendents. And, and a good executive superintendent that does it. It has to be something that is systemic across the board at all times because it's required. System and I don't, wide. right. And I don't want it to be just this, the DOE calling parents and saying, what, how can we help you? It's also telling parents, how can you be a part of this? So that parents are empowered and they are able to share their ideas because after all, they are the first teachers of their children and they know those children better than anybody else. So if you put us at the table with you at the school level, at the district level, at the city level, then we can really create a system where everyone is heard and all the needs are, our needs are met. And, and, then and, we've, and then we've addressed this communications problem. Absolutely, because it, it will never be perfect because no one is perfect, no system is perfect. But at least we have to have the infrastructure that allows the, the, those kind of exchanges among the stakeholders. You, you know what emerged from uh, the last two um, uh, statements that I heard um, was uh, Ms. Giordano referred to District 10 and you of course are the um, uh, president of the parent group in uh, uh, the CEC group in District 8. For people who are just into the system, they don't know what that means. In the old days, that was defined your whole school experience. And I know there are issues with, with the, the, the school districts. We, we've been through that. But once they made that change and yet kept this whole organization in the background of school districts, if you're a new parent, if your child is now in kindergarten, or first grade or second grade, and you tell them District 10, you're like, What's that? I thought we had the DOE. So I'm, I'm just reacting to what I heard. This is another one of the things that uh, keeps people away. Uh, Ms. Tsai, let's just talk about um, uh, the digital divide. It was something that came up in, um, uh, in all of the forums that we did, and it'll keep coming up. Uh, Ms. Giordano uh, referred to it. Um, for special ed kids who may need specialized devices, that must be as challenging, if not more challenging than anything. Oh yes, when you sp when you speak about special ed devices, which is called assistive technology, that's right. Those devices are for students that are particularly unable to use our typical devices like you and I, and we have children that are nonverbal, and prior to this pandemic they weren't able to access those because as long as you don't have it on your individual educational plans, they are not available to you. And it's funny to say that about communication because if a parent doesn't know that these are actually available in the uh. market, then parents don't get it and they don't have it to use. And so when we came into remote, a lot of our families, especially here 
in uh, the Bronx had no idea how to use a computer with their child who's nonverbal. How do you teach a child through a computer screen? And, and so uh, I, I don't even know what to say about this. Um, how are many of those children doing? Did they just really not have school at all during a period of time that they were not able to attend? without an assistive device, without all of the, uh, you know, you're talking about real issues that it seems like in the pandemic would be like for some people, you know, in last place to try and address. Absolutely. And, you know, the oh, DOE so has kind of breaks my uh, heart. I'm sorry to say. It does. And, you know, this is, this is, as I said earlier, historically an issue. And when we came to the pandemic, us parent leaders had to rush out to different organizations that we're a part of to ensure that organizations that can uh, adapt for excessive tech devices be available to families for free, for loan, and probably even have them keep it as long as they're in the school system. So um, so very fortunately, we have these partnerships and we have some wonderful organizations that helped our parents out. But again, you know, you need someone to help you be able to access it, navigate it, understand how to use it. And you want, what I want to get at and what we try to sure. do in those forums is make it become systemic as opposed to, oh, here's Amy calling up and saying we need this for our school or for our kids. It should just uh, be everywhere. Um, I, I want to make sure we're going to start with the parents this time and get to the principal last. I want to talk about something that's always been on my mind, and I've had this uh, discussion with Ms. Despain's, um, and I've expressed to her that I'm very concerned about curriculums. I'm very concerned about, especially now when children come back to school after being away, if they can draw, if they can paint, if they can play music, if they can do athletics and have good recreation, that'll open them up so that when they get to math and science and all the other things, they'll be ready to learn. And I'm concerned that our curriculums are, you know, are so test heavy that the kids don't get a chance. So we'll start with the parents about that. And then uh, let's find out how MS 45 deals with those things. So Ms. Despains, what are your thoughts as if I don't know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, uh, generally speaking, uh, we just need to address the whole child when it comes to education. And not everybody is, you know, math and science oriented. That doesn't mean we couldn't get them to become math and science oriented if we approach the teaching of those materials, right? As differently. Because for example, we know with math, right? Music, like when, when you get a child to learn to play an instrument or to understand how music works, well, guess what? You have opened their minds to math. Right. When mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, the arts, you, you have opened the child up to literacy. And for us. In no, and, and, and excuse me, I'm really also thinking about the mental health of a child. Absolutely. A child who plays music, it will change their lives. And I've repeated, I think I repeated this on the forum. You know where one of the best orchestras in the Bronx is? The Albert Einstein College of Medicine doctors. So I always say, if you want to become a doctor, learn to play the violin. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm I, sorry. I couldn't resist. No, no, I, I, absolutely. And, and that's when we need to understand that different kids learn differently and enrichment programs are actually helps, uh, you know, help everyone to learn, but especially those who may be behind, either because liter uh, in terms of literacy, they came in uh, not too strong. And then the, the kid, you know, the schools have to help them get there. That's one way to do it. And on top of that, if th these kids are not uh, college bound, well, let's give them ways to explore themselves so that they can figure out what is best for them in terms of the arts and in terms of sports, because you know what? It takes all of us to build a society. Well, all those different towns. I, I know exactly what you, you tried not to say it takes a village, but that is actually what, <laughs> what we're talking about. Uh, Ms. Giordano, uh, one of the issues in, in delivering those things, of course, is having the personnel and the teachers to do it. And um, I know from a principal's administrative point of view, it's not always easy to do that. Uh, what do you do? I know in your mind, you'd love to do this all the time and you know, all the, as much as you can. What, what do you do at MS45 to kind of address this sort of thing? So currently we've never, we have an art teacher. We have a visual arts teacher. We've also had a grant through CAW, um, uh, an art grant. So pre-pandemic and even during the pandemic, we were able to provide um, art in school. And 
to Ms. Sai's point regarding, you know, the technology, she's absolutely right. If kids don't have it, they can't do it. But my art teacher was tasked with finding ways to um, have her remote students do art using certain technology that we bought. So the school mm -hmm. bought whatever program. In addition, like every school, we gave out as many devices as we had. And then with respect to the um, enrichment, and, and I agree with both parents enrichment and yourself, enrichment is key. That enrichment has to come in now through the way we're teaching children without being an addition. You yeah, can't it's gotta have be addition. curricular, yes. It's gotta be part of what you're doing. So if you talk about joy in teaching and learning, and you talk about the child and he or she feeling and seeing his or herself in what that curricula is, there's going to be joy. They're going to want to learn. The of enrichment course. comes in the projects because fortunately, you know, there's got to be a learning experience in every challenge. So kids are so resilient when they have the technology, they're teaching us. They are doing projects and public service announcements and different things to show their learning because that's what they're enjoying. And of course, if a child enjoys it, uh, they'll be able to do it. Hey, let's mention that Gary uh, did speak to a class to talk about media and broadcasting and being on television. Yes. And I would do that again. Any, You know I would do it anytime. Anyway, um, we're just run, about running toward the end of the program. Ms. Tsai, let's get a final word from you. If, if you had to say to the world, to the mayor, to the governor, to whomever, what does special ed need you know, what's the first thing they ought to do to help it thrive as opposed to always being the, I hate to even think it, the stepchild in the city uh, school system? I have to say, I use this three words so often, equity, quality, and access. And that's really what is it about, that we have to raise the bars for our students with special needs, with disabilities, because for many of them, it's a lifelong uh, condition that they're being challenged with, not just in school, but in their life. And having quality, the best quality as possible to particularly that entire whole of a child from in and out in their community and at their school level. And the access, available access of that they can receive whatever services are there through school, city agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, resources, you know, even uh, outside of you know, educators, because right. that's what they need. Uh, you know, I, during these forums, the one thing everybody talked about funding, the money is there. Well, I don't care if it comes from private companies. I don't care if it comes from, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, budgetary things. I don't care if it comes from, uh, you know, expenses that um, uh, elected officials are allowed. The money is there. They just got to prioritize it for our schools. Maybe I just answered uh, Farah's, uh, Farah Despain's final, <laughs> final point, but just give us 30 seconds about what you're interested in. Yes, what I'm really interested in is really bringing parents to the table to and, the table. and have them advocate for the things that we just spoke about. Like you said, it has to be systemic and the money is there. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. And um, so what's next for uh, MS45, Ms. Giordano? Uh, we, are planning, we are planning for summer rising and I'm so excited for it because I think it's going to be amazing having the partnerships with our community-based organization. Farad to Spain's Amy Tsai, parents in the Bronx, we love you, we need you. And I hate to quote the former president when I said that, but uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you're you really important to uh, exactly what we're doing in our school system. And uh, keep up the great work, Anna Maria Giordano at MS45. And we got to go. We'll see you next week. Good night. Good night.